She telephoned James Taggart. Jim, will you send me a pass to your passenger platforms? I want to meet my husband at the station tomorrow. She hesitated between Balfew Bank and Bertram Scudder, chose Balfew Bank, telephoned him, and made a date for this evening's dinner and a musical show. Then she went to take a bath and lay relaxing in a tub of warm water, reading a magazine devoted to problems of political economy. It was late afternoon when the florist telephoned her. Our Chicago office sent word that they were unable to deliver the flowers, Mrs. Reardon, he said, because Mr. Reardon is not aboard the comet. Are you sure? she asked. Quite sure, Mrs. Reardon. Our man found at the station in Chicago that there was no compartment on the train reserved in Mr. Reardon's name. We checked with the New York office of Taggart Transcontinental, just to make certain, and we're told that Mr. Reardon's name is not on the passenger list of the comet. I see. Then cancel the order, please. Thank you. She sat by the telephone for a moment, frowning, then called Miss Ives. Please forgive me for being slightly scatterbrained, Miss Ives, but I was rushed and did not write it down. And now I'm not quite certain of what you said. Did you say that Mr. Reardon was coming back tomorrow? On the comet? Yes, Mrs. Reardon. You have not heard of any delay or change in his plans? Why, no. In fact, I spoke to Mr. Reardon about an hour ago. He telephoned from the station in Chicago, and he mentioned that he had to hurry back aboard as the comet was about to leave. I see. Thank you. She leaped to her feet as soon as the click of the instrument restored her to privacy. She started pacing the room, her steps now unrhythmically tense. Then she stopped, struck by a sudden thought. There was only one reason why a man would make a train reservation under an assumed name. If he was not traveling alone. Her facial muscles went flowing slowly into a smile of satisfaction. This was an opportunity she had not expected. Standing on the terminal platform at a point halfway down the length of the train, Lillian Reardon watched the passengers descending from the comet. Her mouth held the hint of a smile. There was a spark of animation in her lifeless eyes. She glanced from one face to another, jerking her head with the awkward eagerness of a schoolgirl. She was anticipating the look on Reardon's face when, with his mistress beside him, he would see her standing there. Her glance darted hopefully to every flashy young female stepping off the train. It was hard to watch. Within an instant after the first few figures, the train had seemed to burst at the seams, flooding the platform with a solid current that swept in one direction, as if pulled by a vacuum. She could barely distinguish separate persons. The lights were more glare than illumination, picking this one strip out of a dusty, oily darkness. She needed an effort to stand still against the invisible pressure of motion. Her first sight of Reardon in the crowd came as a shock. She had not seen him step out of a car, but there he was, walking in her direction from somewhere far down the length of the train. He was alone. He was walking with his usual purposeful speed, his hands in the pockets of his trench coat. There was no woman beside him, no companion of any kind, except a porter hurrying along with a bag she recognized as his. In a fury of incredulous disappointment, she looked frantically for any single feminine figure he could have left behind. She felt certain that she would recognize his choice. She saw none that could be possible. And then she saw that the last car of the train was a private car, and that the figure standing at its door talking to some station official, a figure wearing not minks and veils, but a rough sports coat that stressed the incomparable grace of a slender body, in the confident posture of this station's owner and center, was Dagny Taggart. Then Lillian Reardon understood. Lillian, what's the matter? She heard Reardon's voice. She felt his hand grasping her arm. She saw him looking at her as one looks at the object of a sudden emergency. He was looking at a blank face and an unfocused glance of terror. What happened? What are you doing here? I... Hello, Henry. I just came to meet you. No special reason. I just wanted to meet you. The terror was gone from her face, but she spoke in a strange, flat voice. I wanted to see you. It was an impulse, a sudden impulse, and I couldn't resist it because... But you look... looked ill. No. No, maybe I felt faint. It's stuffy here. I couldn't resist coming because it made me think of the days when you would have been glad to see me. 
It was a moment's illusion to recreate for myself. The word sounded like a memorized lesson. She knew that she had to speak while her mind was fighting to grasp the full meaning of her discovery. The words were part of the plan she had intended to use, if she had met him after he had found the roses in his compartment. He did not answer. He stood watching her, frowning. I missed you, Henry. I know what I am confessing, but I don't expect it to mean anything to you any longer. The words did not fit the tight face, the lips that moved with effort, the eyes that kept glancing away from him down the length of the platform. I wanted... I merely wanted to surprise you. A look of shrewdness and purpose was returning to her face. He took her arm, but she drew back, a little too sharply. Aren't you going to say a word to me, Henry? What do you wish me to say? Do you hate it as much as that? Having your wife come to meet you at the station? She glanced down the platform. Dagny Taggart was walking toward them. He did not see her. Let's go, he said. She would not move. Do you? she asked. What? Do you hate it? No, I don't hate it. I merely don't understand it. Tell me about your trip. I'm sure you've had a very enjoyable trip. Come on, we can talk at home. When do I ever have a chance to talk to you at home? She was drawling her words impassively, as if she were stretching them to fill time for some reason which he could not imagine. I had hoped to catch a few moments of your attention, like this, between trains and business appointments, and all those important matters that hold you day and night, all those great achievements of yours, such as, Hello, Miss Taggart, she said sharply, her voice loud and bright. Reardon whirled around. Dagny was walking past them, but she stopped. How do you do, she said to Lillian, bowing, her face expressionless. I am so sorry, Miss Taggart, said Lillian, smiling. You must forgive me if I don't know the appropriate formula of condolences for the occasion. She noted that Dagny and Reardon had not greeted each other. You're returning from what was, in effect, the funeral of your child by my husband, aren't you? Dagny's mouth showed a faint line of astonishment and of contempt. She inclined her head by way of leave-taking and walked on. Lillian glanced sharply at Reardon's face, as if in deliberate emphasis. He looked at her indifferently, puzzled. She said nothing. She followed him without a word when he turned to go. She remained silent in the taxicab, her face half turned away from him while they rode to the Wayne Falkland Hotel. He felt certain as he looked at the tautly twisted set of her mouth that some uncustomary violence was raging within her. He had never known her to experience a strong emotion of any kind. She whirled to face him the moment they were alone in his room. So that's who it is? she asked. He had not expected it. He looked at her, not quite believing that he had understood it correctly. It's Dagny Taggart who's your mistress, isn't she? He did not answer. I happen to know that you had no compartment on that train, so I know where you've slept for the last four nights. Do you want to admit it? Or do you want me to send detectives to question her train crews and her house servants? Is it Dagny Taggart? Yes, he answered calmly. Her mouth twisted into an ugly chuckle. She was staring past him. I should have known it. I should have guessed. That's why it didn't work. He asked in blank bewilderment. What didn't work? She stepped back as if to remind herself of his presence. Had you? When she was in our house at the party? Had you then? No. Since. The great businesswoman, she said. Above reproach and feminine weaknesses, the great mind detached from any concern with the body. She chuckled. The bracelet, she said, with the still look that made it sound as if the words were dropped accidentally out of the torrent in her mind. That's what she meant to you. That's the weapon she gave you. If you really understand what you're saying, yes. Do you think I'll let you get away with it? Get away? He was looking at her incredulously in cold, astonished curiosity. 
That's why, at your trial. She stopped. What about my trial? She was trembling. You know, of course, that I won't allow this to continue. What does it have to do with my trial? I won't permit you to have her. Not her. Anyone but her. He let a moment pass, then asked evenly. Why? I won't permit it. You'll give it up. He was looking at her without expression, but the steadiness of his eyes hit her as his most dangerous answer. You'll give it up. You'll leave her. You'll never see her again. Lillian, if you wish to discuss it, there's one thing you'd better understand. Nothing on earth will make me give it up. But I demand it. I told you that you could demand anything but that.